Hey, everybody, this is Christian Buckley. I am excited to be back with another Collab Talk Tweet Jam summary. And uh, the topic today was expanding Microsoft's partner service economy. And I'm joined here today by from with App Points Jason Beal. Hey, Jason, thanks for joining. Yeah, it's great to join. And uh, I really enjoyed my first official Tweet Jam today. So it's good to be here. It's, uh, yeah, I think it, 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 I always start off like as I post out to the Tweet Jam, I say, you know, anybody that follows me, uh, get ready to, to drink from the Twitter fire hose. And that's how the Tweet Jams, if you tr attempt to follow along with every conversation, you quickly get uh, left behind, left in the dust. Yeah, I noticed as I was, you know, continually refreshing, and so and I'm sure there was a better way, but I was continually refreshing and there would be 13 seconds and then 16 seconds and 27 seconds of messages were coming in. So it was fun, but uh, you're right. It's difficult to digest all that content. Well, you know, I miss the old days when the Twitter API was open and we had that dedicated page. And sometimes what was it was fun to see that, but it also was because that would refresh like every second. And so you just see it flying by because they, you know, every second there might be multiple tweets. And so it just goes by very quickly, but um, yeah, it's, it's always great. And that's why I, I'm uh, you know, thankful for the Tigraph partnership and the tools that they provide. And anybody could go find that if you go to uh, link.tigraph.com, WAC, Collab Talk, and you'll be able to find everything, all the stats from the event, as well as every single tweet in order that was shared during the event. Well, we typically do a partner focused topic. Uh, after the partner conference, which is every July, so Microsoft Inspire. And so this was a little bit different, but given that there's so much that's happening and, and happening the channel side of things, of course, that's your area. Um, but why don't we let you do, before we jump into that, introduce yourself, what you do, your role at, at AvPoint, and we'll go from there. Sure. So I'm now officially 90 days into my AvPoint tenure. I joined about the middle of December I came from a cybersecurity company, and then before that, I came from uh, distribution. I have been in the IT industry all about two decades, um, living and working both in the United States and in Europe, presently back in the United States and based out of Southern California, and I lead our global channels and partner ecosystems with AppPoint. Well, it's great to have you on, and I know that... Uh... You know, part, part of this discussion, there's been things that have been happening in the MVP and the RD circles around partner, around channel development. And of course, you know, in my role and your role, we've been having conversations around this and I thought it was a timely discussion to talk about. So let's jump right in. So seven questions, love to get your take on these. So let's start with question number one was, Microsoft talks about growing the partner services economy. Um, where do you see the greatest future opportunities within the Microsoft partner ecosystem? You know, I've had a lot of conversations with partners and I've seen a lot more partners, you know, focusing even more on services than they always have. So partners have always been quite services centric, but you know, really there is a heightened focus, heightened sensitivity, more investment and more strategy in that. Some of that heightened, um, focus on services driving some of this M&A activity, in fact, that you see in the channel. Yeah. And then the other term that I would say is, is, you know, pretty hot with partners is DevOps. Microsoft is doing a great um, service to the industry by talking about the needs for driving custom solutions, right? ISV to ISV work, integrating in the platforms, developing, having partners really develop intellectual property or co-create IP with them or with other ISVs. And so that's certainly a hot topic. I'm gonna you know, look at the Microsoft technologies that I as a partner am selling, build out that total economic opportunity, which might include hardware, might include my services and might include either custom or integrated uh, software. Yep, and, and I know that we've got some other questions where we'll go into a little bit more. I mean, you know, it, with AppPoint as an ISV and obviously has services sides, but you know, you're building out the channel uh, for, for AppPoint and see that opportunity and push those opportunities to partners. But beyond even you know, what a, a people think of as the ISVs and the SIs or the consulting companies, the strategic integrators, 
and and I mean Microsoft has talked about you know companies to uh, expand and add add on uh, MSP and CSP capability to look into uh, learning development training aspects and kind of really expand their thinking uh, and it goes back I think it was the first or second keynote that Satya Nadella gave after he became CEO of Microsoft, where he called, you know, says every Microsoft partner is a software development company. Like every company is a software development company. And he wasn't saying, hey, every company go out and become an ISD, but it was kind of pushing those boundaries of look at what your customer is trying to do and figure out if I want to grow my business, how can I help better help those customers solve their, those business needs. And it might increase the boundaries of what I thought an ISV was, an SI was, you know, and do some of these other things. So uh, it was interesting to get some feedback from the community on that topic. Yeah, you know, there's, there's a, um, if you look, you know, at, at the end customer, whether it's for their particular company, whether it's for their particular industry or even their particular geography slash nation, right? There are, there are individual needs and requirements. An end customer has some homegrown software applications. They may have some you know, third party and proprietary applications specific to an industry. And then they may have you know, a full suite of, of what we would traditionally see as some of the industry leading enterprise software applications and platforms like Microsoft. The trick, the opportunity for that partner community is again, how do we bridge all that together? How do we integrate it? How do we, how do we make sure that there's a solution for the end customer that shares data, makes a very, uh, a very seamless and frictionless experience for that end customer. And that's right now where we're seeing a lot of partners focus. So are they a software company? Man, there's a lot of open source tools, a lot of SDKs, a lot of APIs that's out there that helps a partner help the end customer create these unique solutions. Well, there's, and I know we'll, we've got a question about this later, but somebody made a great comment that just that said uh, something to the effect of, uh, you know, well, you know, Office 365, Microsoft 365 is really just an amazing platform for SMBs. And yet, when you look at the history of the individual solutions, uh, it's all enterprises that had, you know, largely on-premises versions of those solutions. And so it has that history. And so, it, you know, Office 365 and a lot of these cloud services enabled smaller organizations to go take advantage of that. And the key to that is that they no longer require you to go and hire a SharePoint architect who manages the servers that are sitting in your, your building, you know, like that, that world is gone. And so, you could focus on your business and just get more and more of these solutions that a partner or Microsoft is managing on your behalf. I think there's, there's been that evolution going on for quite some time. You know, that AppPoint is a, is, is a kind of a perfect example of this trend that you've, you've seen in the last decade that SaaS and PaaS are taking what were enterprise grade and for enterprise only affordable technology right. and democratizing them for the masses and for the SMBs. So that's what, whether it's Office 365 or there's some of the backup migration governance solutions that an app point brings to market, we truly have democratized enterprise grade technology for the masses. I mean, think about it, Christian, you and I, as small businesses, we can get into Azure and in 15 minutes an hour, we can spin up some incredibly complex IT infrastructure, right? With virtual workloads and storage and virtual servers and applications and pick and choose. What would that have cost us as far as OpEx, CapEx and man hours, people hours, excuse me, 10 years ago. And right. now in 15 minutes, that technology is democratized and we use it, we click, and we pay as we go. Yep. No, it, it's, a, it's amazing. Well, it's a, we'll, we'll talk more about this. Uh, question number two, uh, are you making changes to your business model or capabilities or forming new relationships to expand your Microsoft ecosystem opportunity? I would say, and, I, and let me first speak in, with a voice of partner, right? And some of the conversations that I've had with partners, 
we, you know, partners have always worked together well. As you know, there's been peer groups, there's, there's partner service networks. We do see a lot more of that peer to peering within the partner community to take advantage of each other's strengths and, and to ensure that the solutions that they're bringing to market, they can, they can integrate, work well, and uh, add value to their end customers. So certainly we're seeing that. Second, again, with partner business model, uh, these DevOps capabilities um, go moving even further from the resale of you know, hardware and software licenses to truly bringing out more intellectual property, more unique and custom solutions for end customers. And we're seeing that. And then the continued acceleration of managed services um, and where managed services a decade ago was, let's call it... Uh, endpoint, the server, network monitoring and management. Now we do see a, a full suite of managed services where the uh, partners are managing some pretty complex end customer environment. So it's no longer your basic managed services. We certainly see some kind of advanced and consultative managed service business models from the partners. If you look at Avpoint, it's a company that we also have transitioned from a largely on-prem you know, license and custom software to we're much more scalable through the delivery of our technology in SaaS. We also are customizing technologies to specific vertical markets and industry segments. A latest example of that is our Edutech offering, which is a kind of a much more than learning management for uh, educational institutions that directly integrates into the Microsoft platform. So that's a, it's a perfect example where we've been able to take advantage of, you know, platform approach, integration into the Microsoft suite, customize the solution, build it on SaaS, and then make that available to the masses. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's great. And it's, uh, yeah, I think that there's, uh, you know, especially smaller organizations, tech companies that are concerned about, like, we don't have the bandwidth to go out and build vertical specific solutions. And so they'll even turn down opportunities where they're asking for something very specific is like, you know, through the partner ecosystem, you can actually go and make yourself much larger or in, like in our case, being a large, you know, ISV vendor, um, but partner with these smaller companies that have that industry specific experience to go and build that personalized, customized solution for customers that need something, you know, very specific. So um, I, I'm a, you know, as you know, I'm a huge advocate for the channel, I've been involved with like uh, International Association of Microsoft Channel Partners, IA, IAMCP for, for many years. Uh, and so that is something that, uh, you know, when people ask those questions, I, I generally go to, it's like, well, have you talked to the channel, what partners are doing and, and find opportunities that way? Because I think it just, it just opens up opportunities. Uh, let's see, question number three, has the pandemic changed your fundamental business activities? If so, how, and if not, why not? Yeah, thought, thoughts yeah, on that. I would first let me speak personally. Yeah. Yeah, first let me speak personally. I, I'm, I'm one of those that I used to travel every week. All right, so whether when I was living in uh, Brussels, I'd travel all around Europe, uh, Middle East, and uh, come back to the United States and travel domestically and internationally. So for me, it's been a big transition. The, the, the great right thing from a personal level is that I'm spending more time with the wife and kids and I'm, I'm here more when they go to bed. I'm here more when they wake up and picking them up from school and dropping them off at their sports activities. So that's been great. Um, it's been interesting, quite frankly, Christian, to start a new company and have, um, you know, building a team and working amongst a team and not being able to meet people face to face, right? So in, in what I will call them three dimension, we meet face to face on, on teams, but that's been an adjustment. And when you start a company, you wanna, you wanna meet your, your partners face to face. You know, you wanna meet your distributors. You wanna meet some of the Alliance partners, right? And I, I, you know, I haven't had the opportunity and I'm not alone, right? Most of our industry and most, most industries are like that right now where it's been work from home and it's been virtual. So that's been a that, that's been a big change. I will say, you know, there is an art and a science of effectively um, meeting people and building relationships, uh, building rapport and trust, 
and then just effectively running meetings and doing performance management when it's only virtual. And I think that a lot of us have, have been able to kind of learn some of that and share some of the tips and tricks. And then that will continue and that'll make us a much more productive workforce going forward, even when we have the ability to meet face-to-face, -face, but also still work uh, remotely a lot. I think you, know, you will see notable productivity improvements that have come out of this very challenging last 12 months. Yeah, you know, so I've also spent, you know, most of my, the last decade, you know, on the road uh, a lot, um, uh, but I've been working from home most of that time, so almost 10 years, and, and so I'm, I'm always the odd one out that is the, the person that always dials in, but then flies to events and speaks at events and things that all, all over the world and the major Microsoft conferences, um, but I, I made a comment a couple times today during the Tweet Jam that, uh, so I've been working specifically within collaboration technology. Project portfolio management is kind of where I spent the late 90s and into the early 2000s and found my way into SharePoint and got involved. You know, other information management, ERP systems prior to that. Um, but collaboration technology really for the last 20, 22 years focused on, and yet, uh, Throughout almost all of that time, including my time at Microsoft, uh, all of those companies had policies against work from home as a standard. And so I think one of the changes that's, that's happened, and this is a topic all on its own, I, I realize this, uh, but is, is that if anything, it helped companies realize, hey, there's a lot that we can do remotely. We do not have to have that standard centralized everybody in one place to get a lot of what needs to happen done. Like, like you, I mean, there's, it doesn't replace face to face. There has to be some degree of that. And for the two of us, both being remote workers, I looked at it as being, you know, flying out to headquarters in New Jersey, like once a month or every other month at the very least, and being there for a few days to have that FaceTime with people and, and extend the relationship. Um, but there's so much that can be done because when, you know, anybody's working on a deliverable, we all know this. We just want to be left alone. We close the door. We put on the headphones. And we're in a shared space. And so a lot of the individual contributor work that needs to be done, we just need alone time to focus on that. So that's great. But that has to be mixed with how do we engage? What do we do as a team? And how does that work? So it'll be interesting to look at this next phase as things start to open up again, what hybrid looks like. Because I don't think we go back just to where we were. I think it's going to, to change uh, and yeah. be a hybrid. Yeah, so, they, say it like, they say that telemedicine, right, is a great example of that, where there was always, for whatever reason, the technology was there, but the, the user preference, the patient preference was not to do that. And, and what did we do? We, we drove through traffic to sit in an office, to sit in a waiting room for a long time, to see a doctor for 10 or 15 minutes to drive home through the traffic. Well, the pandemic forced this huge increase in telemedicine. And now they've been blown away by some of the statistics around the number of these you know, remote doctor's appointments and the, and the customer satisfaction. So Will we go back to purely going to an office? No. Will we stay with purely telemedicine? No. But the benefits and, and the productivity and the satisfaction with telemedicine has been proven. And so now the new normal will be something in between. That in between, I my prediction is that we have WebMD. I just need to be able to write my own prescriptions and then we're good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how that works out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, let's see. Question number four. Uh, with Microsoft's new industry cloud efforts, they made these announcements at Ignite. So they talked about the four new uh, industry-specific cloud uh, SKUs, uh, really. But is your business model shifting focus towards verticals? Yeah, again, I'll speak from the reference of my conversations with partners and, and partners of all shapes and sizes and in all geos. And I've seen partners, some partners that have been very focused on vertical markets um, for a decade. I remember, I, I can look back more than 10 years and some of the early managed service providers were specifically targeting the hospitality industry, uh, retail industry in K through 12, because those were you know, ripe targets for that IT outsourcing, watch the blinking lights, 
keep the, you know, the students or the workers up. And they had a sales play and they repeated that sales play. And boy, there were plenty of K through 12 school districts, hotels and, and uh, you know, retail slash other hospitality for them to go after. And they ran that play and they built huge businesses focusing there. Um, you have other partners that based on a particular application that they either had written or go to market with was specific to a, a legal vertical or a pharmaceutical vertical. Then at the same time, you have a lot of partners that are quite horizontal in nature and, and like to reach out to, to the masses. You know, they may target SMB or they may target generally mid-market or they may target generally enterprise, but across horizontally across many different industry segments. So I don't know, I haven't seen, and I haven't seen any, any notable trend in my conversations with partners that it's, they've swung one way or another. I would say that the, um, the conversation, once you're into a prospect or in with a customer, that certainly needs to be much more focused on that customer and their industry needs or the line of business needs or the requirements rather than just let me tell you about a, the technology solution. The conversation, the pain points, the problem, the solution needs to be based on that industry and that particular line of business need. But on the main, the partners are either still going deep into a set of verticals or I've seen they're still more horizontal. Right. Well, there again, that's, I mean, I would look at that as, is potentially if you can find the right partner, a great partner to partner opportunity to go in there. And obviously you have to respect like who's bringing the client in and, and those lines and what role that you play within that. But you know, I've worked with other companies that, that had partners that were competitors, but from all of the marketing materials and customers that they would go after. And yet they would work together and bring in uh, you know, consultants that had vertical depth expertise on these horizontal solutions so they could go at this together and they worked out something, you know, a, a deal between them. And so that's something that like the, you know, within the Microsoft partner network, MPN and within IAMCP specifically, it's really what that's geared toward. So it should be, I guess my point is if we're talking broadly about how business is changing, evolving and how we can grow with kind of the, the new rules of working within the ecosystem is that you should you know, not saying no to a potential client project if bringing in a partner it might be less dollars, fewer dollars for you for the overall. Mm -hmm. That's business that you might not otherwise win without partnering up around something. So, you know, go and weigh, weigh the, the, the pros and cons of that. But yeah, I'd agree. But it's the other thing I was thinking too is that, you know, Microsoft for, uh, you know, a long time has been focused on uh, the, vertical solutions. When I joined Microsoft in 2006 and was part of MMS, which is Microsoft Managed Services, which became BPOS, mm -hmm. which became Office 365, um, I was the liaison for the MMS team working with HMC, which is the hosted messaging and collaboration team. And they were going and building uh, small to medium business server solutions for verticals and would package a bunch of stuff together with SharePoint as, as part of that and go as an on-premises, you know, solution that they would drop in. And so that's, you know, they, they've always focused around that. But when you look at a lot of what we do, especially around collaboration, this is true for Avpoint, while we may have, we've got certainly depth of customers, of wins, of case studies in every vertical that, you know, that you can think of uh, mm -hmm. globally. Um, but the, these are, you know, collaboration, communication, messaging um, solutions that are horizontal solutions. Like they're, they're fundamentally the same across the, the various uh, uh, verticals. So it really comes down to, you know, uh, uh, where are we finding the most traction with customers or where are those, those opportunities to kind of drive where we might go and create vertical solutions like the Edutech, like the, you know, things that we've done within the, the federal, state, and local government space, you know, a lot of solutions in that area. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly would, would pivot off of that by uh, I giving you a, a sneak peek or a bit of a teaser on the enhanced partner program that's coming out from Avpoint. And 
we refer back both to, to what you had just mentioned and what we were talking about at the beginning with partners uh, doing more and more DevOps and really wanting to co-create IP. I mean, AppPoint is in a wonderful position with the technology that we have, the, the platform on which it's built to work hand in glove with the partners in order to customize some last mile solutions for particular customer or vertical needs. Mm -hmm. And we wanna build a true next generation partner program that's not necessarily based on simply the resell of our software, but really on creating unique and differentiated solutions for end customers. And you'll see us working really closely and having like opening up a lot of capabilities and resources to our partners in order to co-create IP for specific customers and vertical markets. I know a lot going on there and, and uh, you know, a lot, lot of activity happening behind the scenes here with uh, Avpoint for sure in this space, which is why I wanted to uh, have you on for this, uh, this yeah. discussion. Um, all right, so question number five. Um, so many customers employ solutions across different cloud platforms. How important to your business is support for multi-cloud? And I, you know, and I, and I actually extended this a little bit. I said, I know they're completely different things, but I said multi-tenant as well as multi-cloud. Yeah. And I have two different things where you might have, I mean, a lot of multi-tenant that happens when there might be an acquisition and they are also a Microsoft 365 client, or you have multiple domain names, multiple properties within one corporation and maintaining those and working across those some similar issues with multi-tenancy, mm -hmm. with multi-cloud, where you want to have a consistent, you know, way that you manage all of your data, no matter where it is. Yeah, you know, I, I tend to look at this from a pretty practical perspective. Like, so first, Christian, imagine that, you know, you and I have Buckley Beal MSP business together, and we try to go win a customer to, to provide managed services for them. I think we're going to have more success if we go in and we say we can help to optimize and manage your your existing environment over time we'll show you how you can potentially reduce some costs reduce some resources and then standardize on particular technologies which will drive additional benefit that's probably a a, a, um, a more successful strategy than if we said if we win your business we need to flip you and pull you out of this cloud and take you off of this piece of software and take you off of this one in the immediate term, right? So I think that's one way that I look at it. Uh, second, on the multi-tenancy side, like certainly for a managed service provider where they are able to derive real leverage, real cost efficiencies and thus profitability are by working with vendors like Avpoint and even, you know, other software or hardware companies on you know, truly having multi-tenant solutions, single pane of glass, a very consistent way to manage their end, their end customers at the click of a button. As far as multi-cloud, you know, I, I, I'm one of those that believes it's, it's, a, it's a hybrid world. Some customers will still want or need certain things, you know, on-premise in some sort of proprietary or private data center. They'll have others that are out in a public cloud. They may have multiple public clouds. There's, in this industry, as you know, Christian, there's just constant innovation. Who knows what's coming around the corner in three months from now, that's the latest technology that has some notable impact to quote unquote online storage, whether it's functionality or cost which then changes the way that an end customer could, could make a decision around what's stored here or, or, or what's hosted there. Right. Well, I just look at it practically. If I'm a partner, I may have a great allegiance to a wonderful partner like a Microsoft, but I also have to be, I have to recognize that for my end customers, they may have disparate or multi-cloud or multi-tenant environments. Uh, and in order for me to add the most value to them and come off as somewhat you know, agnostic, um, I need to be able to work with those uh, various clouds as well. Well, you know, I, I just, I know from a lot of my friends that are you know, on the engineering side that uh, you got friends at uh, like Rackspace and other hosters, providers, and we'd always talk about, um, you know, how, you know, in the early days of Azure, uh, how 
well SharePoint, for example, performed on AWS or Rackspace compared to Azure. And, uh, and I know that that's no longer the case, you know, it's, it's cheaper and it performs on, on Azure. Um, but it just kind of speaks to that issue, especially go back to kind of the vertical topics. There might be, uh, you know, advanced solutions in a certain vertical that are essential to a business. They might be yeah. Microsoft shop and have all those pieces, but need that healthcare solution, which yeah. is hosted over on Oracle or AWS yeah. or wherever. Uh, and, and so to, to be able to, for, for companies to be able to understand it, maybe you still specialize in the Microsoft stack. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think you, it's very few companies in the world uh, that exist still that are a, we're a pure Microsoft stack. That's, we don't touch anything unless it's on one of those things that, uh, you know, people who say that are usually unaware of all the shadow IT efforts that are happening within their organization and where their data actually lives. Um, we can have that argument. But the reality is from an enterprise perspective, especially, you know, we, the, you need to have uh, a backup of very various options there. Uh, and, and so it's, it's a standard thing. It's becoming a standard thing to have the multiple clouds and, and for vendors like AdPoint to be able to support you know, our yeah. customers and their data wherever it lives um, through these integrations, primarily Microsoft, but be able to communicate with and collaborate through other solutions and clouds is essential. Yeah, yeah, with that point, you know, we have, we're a great example. We have our, some of our backup products where we give customers a choice. We'll have it where we're built and it's a complete solution on Azure, on app, Azure infrastructure as close as you can get to the Azure network, which derives certain efficiencies. We also have a bring your own storage opportunity for those customers. Yep. Uh, all right. Oh, this is a big one. Okay. This is what I was referring to earlier. Microsoft is historically focused on the enterprise with channel driving the long tail. Uh, do you see this changing and has your focus on enterprise and or small to medium sized businesses changed? And certainly with, uh, first I'll speak from AvPoint's perspective and SMB is a market that we've been investing in, in the, uh, just the past few years, right? Historically, we've been um, very focused on enterprise and public sector and even the mid market. But boy, you know, the company also recognized a big need around SMB, helping, our, helping SMB customers. We talked earlier about the democratization of technology as we've transitioned to SaaS, making that available to the SMBs. And we've had a pure channel strategy, working with some of the best global distributors on their cloud marketplaces and empowering a network of over a thousand managed service providers with uh, specialty prod products, easily managed and sold on a monthly basis. So we're a, we're a great example, a historically enterprise focused company that has now made the solutions available in a channel delivered model tightly integrated into their Microsoft ecosystem and those Microsoft managed service providers. Um, so th then let me pivot to the other trend that I've seen. And, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to put the public sector market in the guise of enterprise or SMB. Some might equate selling to a small local school district as an SMB and some might equate selling to the you know, Ministry of Defense of XYZ country to enterprise, where I've really seen partners pivot and do a lot more in the past year has been in that public sector, largely driven by a lot of the various uh, stimulus uh, that we needed either to quickly re react to uh, the need to set up uh, collaborative environments and secure networks and secure remote connectivity and secure employees or whether it's been, you know, with the more the broader macroeconomic trends and in, in, in helping, you know, families and companies all around the world, there's a lot of money going in and partners are, are helping uh, public and private entities with that. Yep. Um, the, the, the third thing I'll say is, I mean, I'm a, I've always been a big fan of, of SMB, uh, particularly through the channel. I still firmly believe in that role of that local trusted advisor. I mean, if, if you're a small manufacturer or you're a retail shop, you have a certain core competence, you have certain competitive advantages in what you do, but 
uh, building and, and managing your technology is not your core competence. And so to be able to rely on a local trusted advisor who can come by, understand your business, provide on what you might need to solve immediate term problems, but also give you a nice roadmap, keep your costs down. I firmly believe in that model. And I think with SMB, boy, they need it. They really need it the most. So Microsoft, you know, focusing and helping out their partners on both enterprise and SMB is perfect. Well, I think there's a certain truth out there is that the size of an organization uh, does not determine the complexity of its collaboration needs, of its you know, information management needs. Like you could have small organizations that, that understand and view you know, the data that they have as a strategic. And so they, and they could be in, you know, they could have 50 people that in be work within highly regulated industries and need to have all of the additional controls and security and things of a very large enterprise. And likewise, you see very large enterprises that go and buy this complex software and then use like SharePoint as a file share, you know, that yeah. they don't get the most out of that. So you see kind of both sides of that. Uh, and, and so there are, you know, certainly, uh, you know, opportunities for, for partners like, you know, large ISVs like, uh, you know, AppPoint, small consulting, you know, local regional consulting partners around the world, you know, there are opportunities, again, like through partner, you know, partner, partner opportunities, um, but to, to go in and especially with this democratization of this technology, you know, everybody could have, which 10, 15 years ago, you know, to, to really scale up and get what we have today, you know, would have been like a million dollar solution, you know, entry point. Yeah. And now you can get it for, you know, like an E3, E5, you can get it for, what is it? 30, 35 bucks a person a month for the most robust. And there are cheaper options for that. Yeah. Um, but for that, for that E3 license gets you the, 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 the bulk of the capability, just like any of the largest of enterprises, which is pretty incredible. Uh, but then you want to make sure you get the right partners supporting you on the back end when your needs outgrow that. And you want to more closely uh, align and operationalize the technology to fit your unique business patterns. Yeah, you, you know, you, you brought up a good point as far as, you know, it's not necessarily just the size of the company that you know, directly translates into their collaboration security or their cybersecurity needs. All right. So one industry by industry, country by country, there are more and more regulations, right, around providing data protection, data privacy, and being able for organizations to demonstrate that they have at least tried, right, using state-of-the-art technology and the state-of-the-art processes and partnerships to protect their user data. Uh, you look at, you know, my, I'm a good example, my, my uncle, is a certified you know, financial advisor, financial planner. He's here in Newport Beach, California. He may have a hundred clients. And let's say those clients on average have $10 million under management. That's a billion dollars under management for a very small business. Small company, but, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Small company, but right. boy, imagine how sensitive that data is, the personal data and the financial data for those clients. And you know, hackers are no longer only targeting the state or large enterprise. Hackers are, 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 are everywhere and they're looking for the path of least resistance. And you look at, look at what ransomware attacks are happening on small business because it's easy. And if they can make a quick 35,000 or the 50,000 equivalent in Bitcoin, they're going to do that. So you're right, those SMBs might have you know, just as sophisticated of, of the IT and collaboration security and cybersecurity and data management needs as larger companies do. Yep, agreed. All right, the final question here, uh, and I know this is always, it's always interesting to look at the responses uh, to, to these questions, but the, what are your top three pain points as a partner within the Microsoft ecosystem? So it's always good to end it uh, mm -hmm. from the Microsoft standpoint on a negative note with people like, come on. <laughs> no, but I always like asking that kind of three and you get, there's always one or two people that, that uh, say that's like, look, there's just one thing and it's whatever that one thing is. 
But yeah. the variety of different the feedback, it's interesting to look at the trends to the, some of the responses. But I'd like to know, like, uh, you know, with you relatively new to the Microsoft ecosystem, mm-hmm. you know, do you have it, uh, you know, a top three things that uh, mm-hmm. you have a more difficult time for you'd like to see improved? I think Microsoft, like many of the vendors that are out there, many, many partners have always have opportunities to improve with their go-to-market, with their programs, with the remuneration and compensation. That's programs. the Microsoft language right there. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity. Yes, they have a lot of opportunities. So uh, let me answer it the other way. And I always have a tongue-in-cheek comment where I say every uh, industry survey, every kind of partner survey in the history of mankind that has asked the partner community what they want and need in their vendor partnerships have yielded the same ex- results. Number one, they want profitability. What does that mean? They want a growth opportunity for the technology and a services opportunity. Number two, They need to protect their reputations. That means they need reliable products and they need support when they need support, right? right? And then number three, ease of doing business, right? Partners are juggling so many balls and doing so many. They want vendor products, vendor programs, vendor compensation levers to be easy to understand. So uh, that's, that's the lens to which I would look at it. Every company has an opportunity to improve. Microsoft continues to have, you know, various opportunities for its various partner bottles that it works with. But is there an opportunity around profitability? And this is when Microsoft talking about the total economic opportunity in the services economy. Are the products, you know, reliable, best in class and, you know, great support when they need support from Microsoft and or their distributors or third parties? And then number three, ease of doing business. Are their partner programs, the compensation, this specialization, are they easy to understand and easy to follow? Partners are busy. Partners are busy, right? Keep it easy. Give them something to sell. Give them something to service and then be there to support them when necessary so that you can uphold their reputation in front of those end customers. But I think that's a great summary because I think you're right. I mean, the, the, the problems that exist in partners, they're not unique to Microsoft, the Microsoft partner ecosystem, and they're consistent across there. And, and, and there, it is also an opportunity, you know, for, for partners that can go and figure out how to optimize their relationship with, you know, working with Microsoft and, you know, partnering and partnering with other partners out in the ecosystem. But if you're able to find that so that you can best serve your customers uh, to never say no to deals, to quickly get you know, solutions or get uh, opportunities registered uh, and, and turn that around and all focused on delivering the right solution in the, the fastest way to the customer to meet their needs. Happy customer translates up throughout this. Yeah. But if you can you know, look at that strategically and build that, like there, there is an opportunity for any, any partner to come in the Microsoft, Microsoft ecosystem and to find success. I mean, at that point, here's a company that was built on and for, you know, the Microsoft ecosystem. We're getting ready to go public here in days. I think the, the, the mm-hmm. switch will be flicked here, you know, when we cross over. Um, but the, you know, the, it, just, it just shows that there are opportunities and we've seen partners so much growth, so much success. Um, you know, it, it's uh, the, you know, the opportunities are there for, for partners to go and take advantage of. Agreed. Uh, there, there's always going to be a, a room for improvement across the board, but uh, you know, usually where you have that kind of, you know, that, that, that kind of movement uh, you know, th- th- there's just so much uh, deal flow going through in the, the Microsoft ecosystem that you can't help but find some degree of success in there No. That's uh, my soapbox speech at the end here for the channel. But well, Jason, really appreciate your time talking today. Thanks again for participating in the Tweet Jam. Uh, for everybody that uh, is watching the video out on YouTube, of course, you can find the blog post uh, to this and other information about participating in the Tweet Jams out on BuckleyPlanet.com. And then we're also going to do a summary article that will show up on the Avpoint blog, I think, sometime in the next uh, week or two. Uh, but you could definitely find out more. You can reach out to Jason and myself via LinkedIn and we're both out on Twitter as well. So thanks a lot, Jason, for your time and uh, have a great rest of your week.
Yeah, thanks. This was fun. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. And this was, uh, it was a good catch up afterwards. So thank you.